Welcome to our winter gardening video. I'm Danny from Folk of All Trades. Sam's behind the camera. We're actually going to swap over in a bit, so you'll get both of us to speak today. This video is part of our Simple Living series, so that's thanks to Resilient South for supporting us, which is the cities of Onkaparinga, Mariam, Mitcham and Holfast Bay. And this is a whole series, so we're going to have lots of other videos coming up over the year, so feel free to catch us for those. Um, but this one is our winter gardening. To get stuck into winter gardening today, we are going to talk from the process sort of right from the beginning through to planting in the end, not quite harvesting yet, uh, but we will go right through the process. It's a bit of an introduction. Hopefully you'll get lots of tips and tricks as we go, um, but we can you know, help with more details later on. So if you're thinking about your winter garden, you actually want to think way back in summer, which we're currently in, um, and start planning. And that thinking about the seasons is really important. So we've obviously got our summer and winter seasons. We're here in Aldinga, which is Ghana land. And so actually looking at the Ghana seasonal calendar has been really useful, particularly because the Ghana seasonal calendar talks about the winds as well, hot winds and all these other things to consider. We think about those seasons when planning and then we, we do make up a bit of a plan. Now your plan can be super basic, it doesn't have to be this complicated. I'll just sort of walk you through our, our simple table here. But we have basically, and we have seven beds. So you can see bed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, here it's summer, winter, and then it's going into the summer in the future. So we've, we write down what we're going to put. Now some of these, you'll, if you can read my handwriting, say things like cucurbit and solanaceae. So they're the family groups for those plants. Don't worry too much about that. Um, the the reason we're sort of putting the plants and their family in there is we don't want to put the same type of family of plants in the bed continually, year after year after season after season, because they can build up pests and diseases. So all we're trying to do to make it as simple as possible, don't worry about the complexity, is just trying to not plant the same thing in the same place over and over again. So we just have to map that out, otherwise we'll forget. So for example, in bed one, I've written cucurbit, so that was pumpkins, so that family, the pumpkins and zucchinis in that family. Um, so we're now into winter, we're gonna put some brassicas in there. So that's our collie, broccoli, kohlrabi, things like that. And I've written early there, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then I've even thought, well, next year, because they're an early crop, we might put tomatoes in afterwards. But this change but <laughs> we, we're constantly adapting and evolving it. Um, but yeah, that, that thing of that early, mid and late is probably something to think about with any season, winter or summer. And that's um, so you don't put in 20 cauliflower plants all in one go and have 20 cauliflowers ready all in one go to deal with. So trying to stagger your plantings um, is a good way. And we do that on our plan, otherwise we might forget. So yeah, bit of a plan is a really good idea. Um, it also means you've got a record of what you've planted and, and when. Um, so yeah, we find those really useful. We have an electronic one that we, that we use more. But once we've made a plan, so now I actually know, okay, we've got one row of early brassicas. This is actually half a row. So then I can work out by looking on seed packets and things, I can look at the spacing and actually work backwards and think like, how many plants do I want to plant? Because I'm notorious, like some people might be, of just planting so many seeds and seedlings and then having way too much to fit in, which is fine because I can give them to family and friends, but, but also it's nice to have some sort of an estimate. So I start with that, I think, right, how many do I want to grow and do I have the seeds? I love growing from seeds um, and I highly recommend it. However, it doesn't always work for us. Sometimes you don't have time. So by all means, buy seedlings um, if you need to. But I love growing from seed. Um, I've got some of our own ones here. So this is a, a, a piece and peas grow really well here on Addo Plains um, in winter. I don't know about the hills, but yeah, when the plains it does. Hills you might want to do summer. Um, broad beans is a classic one for all in this in this area over winter. Um, carrots is a great one. These are from Heirloom Harvest. They're a local seed supplier. Um, I've got some kohlrabi. If you haven't brassicas, um, kohlrabi is one of my favorites. Some people don't like it. It basically tastes like the broccoli stalk part of the broccoli, which is delicious. It's my favorite bit. Um, those seeds are Eden seeds. Um, it looks like these are leeks, which we grow all year round here. That's just an all year round. I think they're from seed collection and um, we get some from diggers too. It's another pea. So anyway, we get seeds from all sorts of places. We try and save our own, but also support local and um, organic seed producers. So I'm going to show you how I do my um, growing from seed uh, before we'll, we'll then have a, here's one we did earlier and we'll go out and plant. Like I said, I get my seed. Uh, the punnets I really like using now are these little cell punnets. Uh, I've got some similar ones that I've been growing in. These ones are reuse. The ones here we'll show in a bit are a bit sturdier. These are, these are quite a sturdy one. I think we might've bought these, we've used them a lot. But anyway, I like this sort of side size for starting them. 
We get those, we do clean them if we reuse them. I will use a vinegar and water sort of solution or some people will clean with eucalyptus oil or a tiny bit of bleach and water. Anyway, whatever works for you, but we use a vinegar water and I wash them out and then I spray them and put them in the sun, get the UV on there. The reason to clean them so well is um, to stop, again, pathogens or bugs or anything, like the little tiny bugs, from going plant to plant. So that's been cleaned and dried and now I've got my, um, my potting mix. Uh, in here I have uh, this bit of compost, uh, there is a, I think a potting mix we might have bought from somewhere and added a bit of perlite and maybe vermiculite. There's all sorts of blends. You can add coir, you can add sand, you can add all these sorts of things. So by all means look up recipes, but yeah, we, I sort of wing it a bit, but I do like a bit of perlite or vermiculite in there to add a bit of aeration and, and water holding. Now this has got a little bit of dampness to it. I did bring out my, my face mask because um, when you're dealing with, with potting mixes, if they're really dry, you don't want to inhale any of that. So a bit of health and safety, um, mask and or both really um, making sure it's just a little bit little bit damp it doesn't have to be you know it doesn't have to be super wet but that bit of dampness means it's not so dusty basically so when I've got that um, I've dampened that down so I won't put my mask on but I fill my fill my punnet I give it a bit of a like um, I don't like push push it down but I give it a bit of a tap and then top it up a bit more um, for that and then I make little, this is my little, uh, little sort of hot, so when I put the seed in it doesn't roll around to the edge. Um, and I won't go through the full planting, but then I put my seeds in those little holes and I either cover it up with a bit more soil or I put a bit of the vermiculite on the top. Um, but yeah, that, it's that sort of, it's as simple as it is. You learn and you progress and, you know, with seed, with growing seeds, I still get lots of failures, but I do get some successes. Um, a key thing that you don't want to forget to do, though, is to write a label because you will almost definitely, you, I always do, I think, oh, I remember what's there or something silly, but of course I won't. So it's really good to write a label. So I might write kohlrabi. The better thing to do, another a really good thing to do would be to write the date. So, you know, whatever day it is and then in March 22. You probably don't need the year, I'll probably remember what year it is. But it's, yeah, really good to write the label. These are old um, Venetian blinds. I don't know if they're metal or plastic, or plastic. Anyway, I feel like plastic. But they last really well. I've cut them up and I've used a 4B pencil. I've heard that 4B, it has to be. Um, I haven't tested it out, so I just I just trust. Um, because yeah, once you've planted your seed and done your your label um, and covered it up, obviously then covering that and uh, giving it, you know, with seeds, it's always just like damp, not too wet, but never dry. So always keeping it that little bit wet. I tend to put my ones that have just started, so there's no no leaf on it yet inside um, for constant temperature for hot and cold um, and also just so I can keep an eye on them and, and keep them well watered so they don't need light until they've come up however the moment they've come up you know like they, they've popped their head these are actually a little bit longer but once they have come up even when they're really tiny or even smaller than that they need sunlight and by that we mean direct sunlight so you have to get those into the sun um, in whatever way possible on a windowsill or outside as long as you can water them and we've grown up, this here is our table of um, winter, lots of brassicas in here. So we've got lots and lots of broccolis and cauliflowers. I think this one, oh, some kales, some kales through here. I think these are beetroots and chards. Uh, yeah, all through there. So these, um, some of them you'll see they're quite clumped together, the, particularly the beetroots and chards at the moment. There's multiple ones in there and that's okay. We might thin them out later, thinning out meaning, you know, to separate or you know, but anyway, they'll probably stay clumped. However, things like this punnet, um, so this is some broccolis. Now you don't want multiple broccolis growing next to each other. Each broccoli plant could get, you know, this big. So you need um, them to have their own space and be their own plant. Um, so yeah, we, we look after them as best we can. We try and keep the, uh, the cabbage moth off if, if it's brassicas, a lot easier if it's peas and, and everything else and then we plant them out. And before we quickly go to that, which is Sam, Sam's gonna do, some things we do direct sow. So in, in winter, you're actually, like I said, it's, it's summer now because we're thinking so early. So we actually started these in midsummer. Um, but even some of our things like our carrots, uh, we'll plant carrots out, you direct sow them. So really look, look at each plant and how they're different. But our carrots, although we'll grow them over winter, we'll probably sow them in, what are we, March, April time. 
before things get um, too, too cold. If you plant our little, these little babies out when it's really freezing, they might struggle. But uh, that's on to Sam. So Sam's going to take us over and look at actually preparing the soil, um, preparing our bed and planting our little babies out. So let's go this way. All right, smoothest transition ever. <laughs> so we are planting bed one here. So on that plan, this is bed one. We actually grew cucumbers in this bed earlier in the summer. Um, and then that was such an early crop, we pulled them out and we tried to sneak in one more crop, but it hasn't worked. We planted it too late. So this is a zucchini um, that I'm gonna unceremoniously rip out of the ground. And this is a pumpkin that didn't quite produce fruit either. It was starting to flower, but it just went in too late. So as Danny said, we really like to plant early, early. Um, we just find that really, it really helps. Things get a chance to get going in summer before the heat comes. And then if we plant now in sort of late summer for winter, then the soil's still warm uh, and things can take off. So early, early is the way to go. The worst thing is to get into a late, late pattern and then you know, things just don't work. That's something we've learned over a number of years. So now I've got a pretty clear bed. I did a little bit of weeding before we started, uh, started filming just to save a bit of time. There are a few tiny little mallow plants here. I find just pulling weeds out when they're that small makes it so much easier to keep on top of things. So anyway, all that'll go into the compost. And I just want to clear this bed of any material. There was a bit of mulch here in summer. It's a good, a good thing to mulch. We don't actually mulch in winter. So I put pea straw on top of this. The sparrows and the blackbirds have had a field day kicking it all around. So I just want to clear all that off. That can go onto the path. It's a little bit hard at the moment because of the amount of mulch and bark chip around. It's a bit hard to see what is actually the bed and what is the path, but I'm being really, really careful not to step on my bed. So we are in a no dig garden here. So you can see I've exposed this bed. We've got this, uh, this double tram line of brown dripper irrigation here. So I never step on the actual bed. I'm only stepping on the path. We like a sort of 80 centimeter wide bed. And that's really good because it's easy to step over. It's not tempting to sort of put your foot right in the middle. And it means that I can actually plant like this or do weeding operations. Makes it really, really easy having a, having a bed this width and fits with the, the irrigation that we've set up as well. So that was pretty easy clearing that bed. Some of these will be a little bit more difficult that we've got trellis and lots more plants in. But if you're starting from scratch, if you don't have a nice clear bed, it does pay to really try and take as many weeds off as you possibly can. Um, you can do a bit of digging if you're setting up a brand new bed, but we found over time we're doing less and less digging every year, which is really good for your back, but it's also really good for the soil. You're not turning and inverting that soil, breaking all of the fungal networks and, and disturbing that microbiology that we've been cultivating. So I will add some things to this because it's been, it's been pretty well stripped out by the growing of the, the plants over the summer season. So one thing that we tend to add is a bit of gypsum. So this is, it almost looks like sand, but it's a bit finer than that. Um, it is a, a mined product, something that comes out of the ground, a natural thing that they, um, they mine. Um, and the reason I'm adding it is that we've got quite heavy clay soil here and gypsum's really good at binding those clay particles together, um, which means that you get a much better structured soil. We're also a bit deficient in calcium here. A soil test identified that, and so gypsum will add that calcium for us. So I'm just going to sprinkle it on top of the bed because I'm not doing any digging. I'm just going to let basically the rain and, and us, us watering and the microorganisms take everything down into the soil. So just giving a bit of a dust, nothing too scientific. I usually do it by a visual, just want a bit of coverage. And I don't need to spread it out you know, where the plants aren't growing. I'm just concentrating on, on working this soil that we know we're going to be growing in. The other thing I've got here is a product called Rapid Razor. So this is a pelletized fertilizer. So it's got things like manure and seaweed uh, and rock dust and lots of, 
lots of micronutrients, but also the big three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the things that plants really, really need in abundance to grow well. You don't want too much, so I'm not gonna overdo it, but I'm gonna sprinkle some of those again on top of the soil. Basically what will happen is these will slow release as the plants are growing. It won't be this huge hit to the soil all at once. As we water and the rain eventually comes in winter, it'll just slowly introduce those into the soil. Now the reason I fertilize and don't just compost is because while compost is the most amazing soil conditioner and soil food, it's got so much in there, so many goodies for, for the microbes to eat, which then help feed your plants. They, it doesn't tend to have a huge amount of really, really nutritious stuff in it, like potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's because we tend to eat that stuff um, and some of it gets lost to the environment as well. So while I always advocate adding compost, we do actually need to add fertilizer as well. So I'm just gonna sprinkle this on top pretty generously. You can see how many eggshells are in there. Hopefully that'll add some calcium to our soil as well. And this is basically all the mulch that we're gonna have over winter. One of the benefits of that is that it's dark in color and that's actually gonna help the soil stay warm. And evaporation's not as big of an issue over winter. So you'll find a lot of the market gardeners, like our friends Stephen Hoffner and people at Village Greens, they don't mulch over winter. We're wannabe market gardeners, so we do what they do. All right. That was a pretty good estimation. I'm notorious for not getting quite enough compost, and then I have to go back and get some more, but I think I've done a pretty good job today. So that's relatively well spread, but I'm just gonna give it a little bit of a, a tickle with the rake, just to smooth it out a little bit. Now this is pretty chunky compost. I don't sieve it or anything like that. It's homemade, as you can probably tell. You've never seen compost like this at the landscape yard. But because I'm not incorporating it into the soil, it doesn't actually matter that there's some chunky bits. Um, that's all gonna be food for the microorganisms that'll, that'll continually feed over it for the next six months until we, until we apply more compost. So that's another benefit of not actually incorporating into the soil. If you had an unfinished compost like this and you actually dug it in, uh, it would rob nitrogen from the soil as those organisms try to break it down. But leaving it on the surface, they just come up and sample it and take it down as they like, which is great, Ex low work. I'm always trying to find things that are less work. So we've got some seedlings here that Danny's lovingly grown. This one is broccoli and is it Walter or Waltham? Waltham, yeah. This is a, a broccoli that we've grown for a number of years and it works well in our situation. Decent sized heads. But the key, the absolute key to getting a good sized head on your broccoli is to give the plant enough space. Um, I see people putting them really close together and that means they're just competing with each other and they can't grow big enough to generate enough energy to make that really big head. So 45 centimeter spacing I think is about ideal. Now we've got 30 centimeter spacing on our drippers. Danny, you might be able to see this. There's a dripper hole here and a dripper hole here. Those are spread 30 centimeters apart. So that's quite a nice measuring stick for me. Now, 45 centimeters, if I put, this is, this time is probably getting a little bit close. We might have to prune that back. If I put my first plant here, let's say we'll put a broccoli here. I'm gonna put it on the outside of the bed because that gives more space. So it's gonna get dripped directly. We're gonna put one of these broccolis in. How about you? So I'm squeezing around the pot. You can give it a bit of a tap. I find tapping on top helps it jump up a little bit. And then ideally you pull from the leaves because if you accidentally snap off a leaf, the plant can grow a new leaf. But if you snap the stem or damage the stem in some way, it can't grow a new stem. So that's a really nice looking seedling. Well done, Danny. Nice tight root system. I'm just gonna fluff it out a little bit. 
You wouldn't want to leave it too much longer than this before planting because it will start to run out of energy and just get a bit too big. I'm going to plant that a tiny bit deeper. So just digging the right size hole for the seedling. It's okay to bury slightly deeper your veggie seedlings, but what I actually love is to plant them almost flush, but to leave a bit of a bowl. Now, when I come to, to water this plant in, that means I'll be able to give it a decent amount of water, with that water without that water flowing away. Okay, so that's 30 centimeters. If I planted another broccoli here, that would be too close together. So what I actually want to do is plant at the next one. So that's 60 centimeter spacing. So, you know, in winter, you might be able to get away with, with planting them at 45 centimeters and just doing you know, random scattering. Um, we can't really do that at this time in summer. We might still get quite hot weather. So I'm gonna plant them at 60 centimeter spacing, but plant something in between. So I'm not losing out on that space. So 30 centimeters, 60 centimeters, don't need my ruler. So again, digging a relatively deep hole for the size of the seedling. This is Wombok cabbage, beautiful Chinese cabbage. That one can go in too. And just pressing that in firmly. So what I like to put between is actually something like, oh, I've left it over there, that's okay. I'll put something like brock, um, beetroot in between here or kohlrabi, something that doesn't mind that little bit of extra competition um, and something that's gonna stay quite small compared to these broccoli and, and wombok's gonna get much bigger. Now. I said 45 centimeter spacing. Ideally, you would offset that on the other side. So this is my dripper line here. I've got one hole, one hole, one hole. So I'm gonna plant another big brassica here. So I've got a beautiful red cabbage, which is one of my absolute favorites. This one's called Red X. Red Express. Ah, oh, Red Express. <laughs> I only ever see the plant label as Danny's the seed person. So I always just see the shorthand. So that one's going in. And press down. And so as you pull out now, you'll be able to, you'll be able to start to see the pattern. So although that's probably, that is probably 45 centimeter spacing actually, but by offsetting it that way, um, you can fit in a decent number of plants, but give them the space they need. Um, if in doubt, give them a little bit extra space. We certainly do that with our tomatoes. We've, we've continually increased their spacing and we're finding we're getting better and better results. Um, the seed packets, you know, it can be a little bit hit or miss. So talk to other people that are growing and, and do experiments. That's really, really valuable. So what I'm gonna do here is water these in. Uh, we like to put a dash of something like sea salt um, or some other seaweed seaweed based uh, tonic and that just helps with transplant shock so we've we've kind of shocked these plants um, they were in this beautiful little environment where they're getting watered three times a day so they're going into the soil they need a little bit of time to adjust um, we'll keep an eye on them for the next week probably watering them you know every day um, and then the irrigation's also going off twice a week at this point so after that week they'll pretty much be okay on their own and, and have started to build decent root systems. So that's how we do our winter gardening. Seven more rows to go, plus a little bit more. So we better get to it. Um, thanks for joining us and hope to see you in the next one.